Well, good morning, church. It is time for us to get started. I love all the uh, fellowship going on, all the conversations, um, just seeing and, and talking and, and being with each other again is such a warm and beautiful blessing to continue to enjoy. Um, and I know I can speak for my family when I say that we are so happy uh, to be back here again um, after being out for a, a couple of weeks, but also so thankful to so many of you who, who reached out, um, who, who inquired, who uh, were offering prayers, and, and who even and brought some food uh, while we were in our quarantine. Um, and I always find it fascinating how, how time works. Like, you know, when you're involved and, and in motion and, and things are going on, you know, time can just pass so quickly. But then in those times where you have to stop or you're forced into stillness, it can seem like time just creeps by. You know, and, and it, it's, you generally have one of those responses to where when things are going, you're just kind of like, I, I, I can't believe it's this time or I can't believe it's this late in the week or, or this far into the month. And then those other responses tend to be more like, oh, it's only today. Or it's only this time. And so we, we had some different opportunities throughout the last couple of weeks where we definitely felt both of those uh, uh, feelings. You know, and not only over the last year, but even over the last couple of weeks, one of the things that I've learned or at least been reminded of on some different levels is that anyone can exist, but it takes one intentionally making the choice to live. And I don't want to confuse living with busyness because that's, that's a whole other thing to think about. But, but whenever you choose to live, God provides avenues for you to be productive and to contribute into what he is doing in the world around us. To both touch and bless your life as well as the, the lives of those who are in your path. And, and you don't need to, to mistake that, you know, Getting back to a normal routine is, is, isn't a good thing. It is. It, it, it's, it's, it was good for me this past week to get back to, to the office and, and to get back into some normal routines. But the interrupted path that God often sets before us and the one that he set before me while in quarantine allowed for plenty of opportunity because it allowed me to live in the midst of my stillness and it provided a blessing for me and for many others. Because that's who God is. He is a God of blessing regardless of the circumstances. And that's who what God was for me in several different ways over the last couple of weeks. God continued to teach me that even in interruption, when I give him my time, when I allow him to take responsibility for it, when I give him ownership of it, when I allow him to be the steward of it, it's amazing what all can be accomplished for him and for his glory. But it all starts with a choice. A similar choice that we have this morning as we begin. A choice to make or just to be, to just exist in this moment or the choice to give this time to God, to live for him, to live for his glory, for his honor in the here and now. So listen to these words from God as they are shared. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be, be scarce and you will lack nothing a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, pray, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you to this day. Or this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, you build fine houses and settle down, and your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all that you have is multiplied. 
Then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Let's bow. Father, we thank you so much just for this opportunity to come before you and to worship you, Father. We pray that right now as we're about to sing songs of praise to you, Father, that, that we truly lift up our hearts and our minds to you. Father, that, that you speak to us in who you are and help us to know that and understand that. And all the distractions that, that kind of are all around us and fill our minds and, and all of that, Father, we pray that you strip them down this morning, Father, that we truly give you this time. And Father, that even as we go from this worship that we give our lives to you, you are an amazing, amazing God. And Father, we owe you our lives and much more. And Father, we pray right now that, that as we give you praise, Father, that, that you will speak to us, reveal to us who you are, and help us to see what you want us to hear and what you want us to do. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees of skies and seas his hand the wonders wrought this is my father's world the birds their carols raise the morning light the lily white declare their maker's praise this is my Father's world, He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear Him pass, He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world, oh let me my father's world why should my heart be sad the lord is king let heaven ring god reigns let earth be glad there's a passage in first samuel 7 where the israelites face off against the philistines as they did so many times and God brings victory to the Israelites. And in an awareness of that victory, Samuel sets a stone out. And he says, it, Scripture says, Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So anytime we sing about raising an Ebenezer, it's a stone of help. It's an acknowledgement that God has taken care of that God has provided, and that we are indeed in our Father's world. O oh, thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness prove. While the hope of 
infinite glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, by my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee, never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified, they laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, till I am just a Lamb of God. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how often God presents himself in new ways and how he subtly points and directs all along different paths as we go through life. But it takes an attentive ear. Because if you're not tuned in, those paths, those opportunities are easy to miss. For me, they often come in short little words or, or short little phrases as hints, as I kind of like to call them. They can easily be dismissed or set aside. But the beautiful thing about it is, is that even when we miss them, or even when we choose to intentionally skip them, God is still faithful to offer them again and again. Because that's who he is. God is faithful. 
And it's not just when we listen, not just when we act a certain way or do what he wants, but he is faithful no matter what. It's part of his nature. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes, he says, if we are faithful, he, if, even if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny who he is. I mean, right there, Paul says that that's who God is. And he can't stop being who he is. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9 says this. It says, understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and on those who obey his commands. So you see, because, because of his faithfulness, because that's who he is, because of his faithfulness to, to the promises that he's made, God is always going to love me. He's always going to love you. God is always going to accept me. God is always going to accept you, and he's always going to be there for me. He's always going to be there for you. And when we read what John writes in his first letter, he says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us all from our wickedness. And so you see, we can also know because of his faithfulness, he will always forgive us when we ask. And that's only possible because of what he did through his son and his willingness to sacrifice his one and only son. I mean, I don't know about you, but each time I stop, each time I consider the magnitude and the reality of what happened on the cross, it never gets old. It never becomes routine. It never becomes tedious. I, I, I really never even get used to it. It always takes me back and leaves me astounded at the awesomeness of God and his love. So this morning, we've set aside this time to acknowledge and to honor and accept that precious gift of love that was shown on our behalf in the cleansing and purity and holiness that we get to experience, that we get to encounter because of of what he's done. Not because we earned it. Not because we deserved it. But simply because our God is faithful. And that's who he is. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we take this time to come before your throne, It is such a place of majesty and magnificence. God, it, it's, it's hard to take in sometimes. But God, even, even with the, the awesomeness of who you are, it's, it's humbling to know that, that you are willing to come down to our level. That you want to meet us where we are because of your great, unending, and immeasurable love for us. And God, that, that, that love took you to a place that was far from from who you are and what you are as you became this fleshly, earthly being in sending your son, allowing him to be separated from you because that's what love is. That's what love does and because you are faithful to what you have said. You are faithful to the promises you have made. And you are faithful to that love that you have for us. And so, God, now, as we, as we take this cup, as we take this bread, as we're reminded of the, the brokenness of Christ and his body and what you allowed him to endure, what you deemed necessary for him to endure, so that we don't have to pay that same price. 
because we are covered in his blood. And I love the imagery of thinking that God, as we stand before you one day, it's not that we are standing there. Because you don't see us, you see Christ. You see his beauty, you see his holiness, you see his righteousness because of what we have taken on in him. And God, we thank you for that. We honor you for that and we love you for it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. My only hope is you. From early in the morning to late at night, my only hope is you. My only peace is you, Jesus. My only peace is you. Continue to praise God. Praise Father, hear the song we raise. Your children sing a song of praise. We stand before your throne of grace. We long to see your You have seen our need For us you chose to intercede You will not let your faithful fall Praise Jesus, you are all in all Praise Spirit, bless your whole Let us.
us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in a God who is able to bring justice and mercy to all. And he promises strength for the journey to the steadfast to answer the call. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in the truth of the Bible, in its power and purpose today. There is meaning and life in its pages. We believe and we choose to obey. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe that he's calling his people to embody his story of grace. Bringing rescue and hope to the broken, may our lives be an offering of praise. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful. Let us be faithful. And though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful. Let us be faithful. And though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Please be seated. Well, it's great to see everyone out today. Good for Rachel and I to be back uh, here with you. We were able last week to watch online, and uh, it was uh, wonderful to be able to share with you, even though we were away. I uh, thought that uh, Ben did a great job. Uh, we are going to return today to our, our ship series and uh, in relation to his set of lessons last week, we're going to try to keep the ship afloat today, okay? So we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. We're going to talk about stewardship, and uh, that, is a, that is a topic that I have to be very careful about how I communicate and some of the things that I say. I, I recognize that sometimes our communication can be difficult, can be strained. We can say things and hear things that are not exactly what was intended. Uh, I, I think about that from, from one of the most frightening questions that as a parent you can get, and that is the question, uh, where did I come from? And I very much remember with, uh, in particular, uh, my two boys, when we had to have the talk. And there was a mother who was sharing uh, with another group of mothers uh, some of her experience and what she had encountered in this. Her seven-year-old boy was uh, sitting at the dinner table and turned to his mom and asked her the question, okay? 
uh, Mom, where did I come from? And of course, as would happen to be the case, uh, Dad was away on a trip. And so now this was going to be Mom's conversation, and she got a little bit nervous, but remembered that they had bought some books specifically to use for when that question was asked. And so, she, she sat the little boy down, and they began to talk back and forth with one another, and, and she took out the, the, uh, the books, and she pointed to the illustrations and what was happening and what was going on and running through all of those types of things about human reproduction. And he listened very carefully she asked some questions. He, he showed that he understood some of those. And when she finally finished up, she thought she had done an amazing job, frankly, at how she had gone over some of that. And she let out a big sigh and said, Well, do you have any other questions? And the boy looked at the book and, and then looked back up at his mom and, and looked back down at the book again and and finally turned to her and said, Well, yeah, I, I mean, Tommy said that his family was from Chicago. Where did we come from? So, knowing again that there can be problems in communications and questions, I want to be very careful when I ask you this morning, where did your stuff come from? Where did you get your stuff? You see, on one level, it's a very easy question. If you were to come into our living room, uh, there's one couch that we bought from a place. Uh, we got the chairs from yard sales or estate sales or auctions. There was the file cabinet we got on sale at clearance at Sam's 40 years ago, Rachel, pretty close to it. The lamp we got from your mom, I, I could continue on through our house. That's probably most of it. No rooms to go for us, okay? But in this morning lesson, what I really want to do is get to the deeper question, okay? What is the real source for our things, for the stuff that we are stewards now, we need to be very clear as we ask this question, where things in the greater sense come from? Because Scripture does not leave any gray room for this discussion. There's no gray area. There's no, well, maybe, maybe not. This is, as we sang this morning, God's world. This is my Father's world. And as Phil, as you led that, I could hear Buddy Arnold uh, from all those years ago in chapel at Lipscomb always singing that song. Everything that we see is ultimately his. Uh, let me just share a string of scriptures with you. I'll try to give you just a little bit of their setting. Moses replied, this is Exodus 9, Exodus 9, verse 29. When I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. The thunder will stop and there will be no more hail, so you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Now, the context here, this is in those times of the plagues. And so Moses is talking to Pharaoh. And so the person here so that you may know is Pharaoh. So Pharaoh will know that the earth is the Lord's. A little bit later in the same verse, or excuse me, same book, Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 through 6, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole, whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. God is talking here. He's talking to Moses, and he's telling them that he possesses all nations, but he wants Israel to be his treasured possessions. All the whole earth is mine, he says. In Psalm 
50, verses 9 through 12, a little bit longer passage. Again, God is now the speaker in the Psalms. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Now you might assume, well, well now hang on, this is the psalmist writing, and that's poetic. Well, in the book of Job, where there's a little bit more direct statement, Job 41, verse 11, everything under heaven belongs to me. Everything under heaven belongs to me. Acts chapter 4, verse 24, this is talking about the early church. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26, is a statement from Psalm chapter 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the waters. Now, we haven't gone over those passages in detail. I recognize. My point is not exegesis. It's not getting into the text and finding out what it says. It's impact. Because clearly, I've just chosen some passages, there are plenty of others, uh, that reiterate this concept. Our possessions don't belong to us. They are God's. And the truth is, we don't belong to us. Because we are part of this creation. We are God. And we don't like it when people tell us that very much, for a variety of reasons. The first, because we very much like the idea of owning things. We like to have title to stuff. We like it to be ours, that that are our possessions. And there's something very comforting about having this stuff, these things that we own, that we possess, gives us a different mindset. We had a a, a friend of ours who had a Miata convertible, and she knew that I, at that time, didn't have a convertible, but I love convertibles, and I love Miatas, for that matter. And, And she had a very generous spirit, and so... And, and, and so she said to us, she said to me, she said, look, if you ever want to borrow uh, the Miata for, you know, a night out or something like that, you just give me a call and we'll work something out. And I did. But it just didn't feel right, okay? I, I, mean, I mean, a Miata is a sports car, Right? You're, you're supposed to drop the top and slide that thing around a turn and downshift and take the tack up. Oh, man, it's fun to drive a Miata, but not when it's somebody else's. Not when it's borrowed from somebody at church. I mean, I mean it, it, it's different if you own it, if it's yours. The second reason that we're challenged by this notion that everything is God's and and not ours is that we worry what God's perspective might be on our things. It doesn't take a whole lot to get many of us feeling guilty about our stuff. I, I mean, you know, all you have to do is be on a nice vacation Realize that there are other people who don't. Or, or, or to be, you know, looking at your cabinet and, or, or your set of clothes and think about all the people in Haiti that don't have any of that or hardly any of that. I, I mean, look, we can start to wonder, do I have more of God's stuff than I deserve? I mean, if it's all God's stuff... 
How is it that I am so blessed and I've got so much of it? And, and you know, a little bit of the rich young ruler and the widow's might, and, and I could probably get almost everybody in here horribly guilty. In the end, you see, most of us picture God as some kind of a, a massive grouch who, quite frankly, would take back our stuff if he could. So we don't like to think about the fact that God owns it all. Finally, I guess we don't like to think of that because if it's God's to give, then it's God's to take. And none of us likes losing our stuff. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you have had stuff stolen from you? Almost everybody. Wow. Wow. I, I can't think of a time when I was more angry in my life. Now, I, I ought to set this up a little bit. We've had, my son bought a car from his, his brother and parked it in the yard, and one night some folks in the area came, stole a GPS unit and radio and some speakers, okay, I, that, that was, you know, we should have locked the car, okay. I mean, you know, it, it happens. You, you just hate that type of stuff. But right after I moved to Jacksonville, Florida, I, I started noticing, I thought maybe I was losing it because there were, there were things that I just kept misplacing, like my racquetball racket. I just know I left that in the car. And a week or two later, I was going to play with Mark, and, and it wasn't there. And we were playing softball, and I had my softball glove, and I had put it in the back seat, and, and it wasn't there. I got ready to go to the game. I, Rachel, have you seen my baseball glove? No, it wasn't, wasn't there. And, and I just had a number of things like that that were disappearing. And so as I came out of the office there at the Mandarin Church of Christ, I, I came out and we parked our cars under kind of an overhang. There was an 11-year-old boy who was rummaging around in the front seat of my car. And he had my golf glove in his hand. He was 11 years old. He didn't even know what a golf glove was for. And I stared him to death as I came out of the, of the door. I said, what are you doing? He dropped the golf glove. He ran over and hopped on his bike and started pedaling as fast as his legs would go across the parking lot. And I was mad. No, I was beyond mad. I, I was white hot. I hopped in my car, fired up the engine, and I ran after him with my car. And I, I kind of maneuvered like a rodeo cutting horse around this kid. I would turn him around one side, and he would bump into the side of my car and head off the other direction, and I was fired off to get him. I finally pinned him between the fence and my car. At any moment... If he had turned left when I went right, I would have killed that child. And I'd have been in jail for 10 years for manslaughter, properly in jail. You sometimes wonder, how is it those folks do road rage all that? How do people get that mad? Oh, I can, I can find that anger again. Was I mad because this 11-year boy had stolen God's stuff? No. It was mine. He was taking my stuff, my things. And I was going to do anything to capture him. We need regular reminders, folks. That it's all God's. It's all God's. Now, 
as we think about the stuff, we need to understand nothing inherently wrong about things. The Bible tells us that when God made the world, he looked at it, and it was all good. It was very good. And in the years that follow, humanity will fashion a process, if you will, the, the things that God gives to them, and that process is not criticized by God. In fact, in the early church, there were some folks called Gnostics they said that only spiritual matters were good, that anything associated with the physical was bad, and that was an error, and that was repudiated. It wasn't true. Things are good. And the truth is that things don't get denounced in the Scripture. I mean, okay, there are times when God is angered by the carving of an idol, He's upset because the people will try to build this tower up to the heavens in Babel, but it isn't the thing itself, okay? This is key. It isn't the thing itself. It is the use. What creates the problem is the use. For an example, okay, I, I mean, just think about it. Is a Bible good or bad? answer is it depends. If I'm using my Bible as a, a study guide to unlock the truths of God so that I know how I might respond to him, the Bible is fantastic. But what if I'm using a Bible solely for the purpose of trying to overturn it, to disprove its facts? That's not a good use of a thing. What if I have a garden and, and I'm growing stuff, you know, and I know there may be some of you who are thinking about planting, you're worried about the frost that's coming up here in a, maybe in a couple of days. And so you're planting your garden or you're thinking about some of that. Is, is that good or bad? Well, again, it depends. You could share that with others. That's fellowship. Or you could try to eat six pounds of tomatoes in one setting. That's gluttony. It's the use. And it's not even a question of quantity. Uh, I mean, how much we have. In Luke chapter 2, verse 24, we find out that the family of Joseph and Mary, Jesus' family, are at the temple. They're making their offering, and they make the offering of a poor person. But then in Luke chapter 23, verse 50 and 51, we find another Joseph and that man is a good and upright man, the text says, and he apparently is very wealthy. We've already talked about the rich young ruler. There are people who receive God's blessings and acceptance. Whether we're talking about the Old Testament or we're looking at the New Testament, and they have lots of stuff. There are also people who receive God's blessing and acceptance who lack it. Quantity isn't the issue. It's a question of the heart. Specifically, is there a sense of personal pride that has come from that? Gratitude is very different than pride because, because whenever you get a freedom, Especially from God, there are almost always strings attached. We are given material possessions, and they come because we have talents, and we have abilities, and we can create, and we can work, and we can earn, and we can accumulate. But with that liberty, there is also the possibility that we may abuse those gifts. And that is exactly what was in the reading for this morning in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Moses is sharing God's perspective on the experience that the Israelites have. The Israelites have a wonderful gift that's given to them. They come into the land of Canaan, okay? And it is a land that has been described earlier flows with milk and honey, right? It is a land that has already been developed. And after a few decisive battles, they will wipe out the inhabitants. And all that stuff that's in the land, it's now theirs. 
They come to a farm, and there's a house there. There's a barn there. There are walls there. There are orchards. There are trees. There are vineyards. There are all kinds of things that are already... They come to a field that's already been plowed. And the cities all have defensive walls around them. Now, let me again go back. There's not a single word in Deuteronomy 8 or anywhere in the, the first five books of the Bible, what we call the Pentateuch, that says God is distressed that they're getting that stuff. That's not the problem. There is a warning from Moses of a problem, and that is that they think after they come in that they are the ones who are responsible, that they are the ones who deserve this, that they are the ones who have earned it, that they are the ones who possess this, and it's their possession. And pride is without a doubt the biggest danger of things. When it comes to things, I, I know that I struggle with pride. It's very easy for me to, to sit back. Well, you know, in, in 2008, I did a pretty good job of picking up a couple of cars. I got one for Rachel. We drove it in today. Uh, you know, I, I got the guy down on a deal. I found it and located it and got some other stuff. Why we did, it was such a great deal that we got. It, it's so easy for me to think, man, I'm such a smart negotiator. But then I need to remember the words from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. God gives us the ability for those of you who are teachers, God gives you the ability to train and to teach. So therefore, who owns those skills? Who owns the things that those skills provide or generate? And I mean, we could carry that on through. I mean, what about Kevin or Corey or Tim? Their knowledge, their skill... The stuff that comes along with that training. You see, we've got to be very careful of being prideful about our things. I'm going to close with a scripture text from Jeremiah chapter 9. Verses 23 and 24, I, I, I think are just excellent. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight. Our boast shouldn't be on how smart we are or how strong we are or how much stuff we have. Our boast must always be that we are gods. That we are gods. Have you acknowledged to God that your stuff isn't yours, but it's his? Have you acknowledged to God that everything you have, from your IQ to your looks to, to your situation in life, is ultimately from him and because of him? Acknowledge humbly the role that you play before God. Now maybe, maybe this morning what you need to do 
is to, to really focus and put away your pride and your selfishness and humble yourself before him. And frankly, the greatest humbling that you can do is to acknowledge your need and be baptized. This morning, we're still in a little bit of this pandemic stuff, so if you feel that that's something that you need to do today to facilitate that, to make that work, one of our shepherds is going to be down in room 18, out the back doors, down the ramp, to the right, to the right, and and they can talk with you and we can make the appropriate socially distanced arrangements to help you do that today. Maybe you need our prayers on your behalf. Either way, as we sing this next song, if you need that time of prayer, you need that time of guidance, head out those back doors. Do that now as we stand and as we sing. If my heart and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee, take my moments and my tears, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my What a wonderful morning to be able uh, to be together and to worship together. We thank you uh, for your presence here, whether you're joining us online or, or in person. We, we thank you for being uh, with us this morning. We don't have any updates to our prayer list, but I encourage you to continue to lift up all those who are listed on the prayer list. Uh, there are bulletins at the back of the auditorium if you were not able uh, to grab one. Um, also, the newsletter um, will be uh, sent out weekly, uh, just sharing the prayer list. So I encourage you to continue to pray for all those who are on it and continue to lift up each other uh, in your prayers. We also want to celebrate uh, Ella Morgan, uh, who was awarded the Spiritual Leadership Award for uh, Good Pastures Middle School Volleyball Team. So what a wonderful um, honor for her and, and what great representation of Christ um, as she is doing that uh, with, her, with her volleyball team. So wonderful, uh, Ella, and we are very proud of you and, and thank you for your example. Also, Emma and Ella were able to uh, participate in a Good Pasture production of Junie B. Jones and did a, a great job with that, so be sure and congratulate them on that. As far as our calendar, we have a lot of things that are starting to go on uh, on the calendar. Uh, so uh, this afternoon, Phil's small group will be meeting in 206 uh, 208 at 4 o'clock and encourage you if you want to join them with that uh, to come at 4 o'clock in room 206-208. And then our youth will have a Devo this afternoon at 5 o'clock at Matt and Lindsay's home. Uh, so I encourage you to take part in that. And then next weekend, the youth uh, will be away for a spring retreat. So remember them in your prayers 
uh, for that. Next Sunday, uh, there will be a bridal shower for Brittany Breedlove and Jackson Denton. That will be between 2 and 3.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. That's next Sunday. And then also for our children's worship next Sunday, uh, it will be moving to room 206208 um, because of the bridal shower. So uh, whenever you drop off your kids, just drop them off um, on the ramp up on the second floor. And then also, just a reminder, our prayer warrior sign-up uh, is at the back of the auditorium. We actually only have 100 days left uh, for us to sign up for, so uh, great job with that, but continue to sign up for that. And then also remember, uh, when you are done with your day of prayer, to be sure and return the, the prayer cards uh, to the, into the basket at the back of the auditorium. And we encourage you to, to please take part in that, as it is wonderful for us to be able to, to lift up prayers each day uh, to God. On, on behalf of, of the congregation, of each other, and the community uh, through the rest of the, of the year. Thank you. Good morning. What a beautiful day outside. Beautiful day to be together, to worship, uh, to sing, sing songs of praise, and to hear a great lesson. Uh, Martin told a story this morning about miscommunication, and uh, we probably had a little bit of that this morning. So, uh, Martin, just so we're clear and for everybody, we'll be offering the invitation down here uh, moving forward. Uh, the opportunity to, uh, you know, if you want to put God on in baptism, uh, if you need the prayers of the church, uh, whatever that may be, we want to be here to, uh, uh, to strengthen you, to pray with you, and be a part of that moving forward. So, I uh, apologize, Martin. That was one of those. I thought somebody else was taking it. Somebody thought I was taking it. So, so anyway, we'll be doing that. Uh, a couple of corrections, or actually uh, just exciting exciting um, things to point out, but a few corrections to the bulletin. Um, it was mentioned last week we will be starting our Sunday school classes back on May 2nd. That is correct. Uh, it's shown in here, uh, worship assembly at 930. That is correct. We will be doing that at 930. Uh, and we want to, to provide opportunity for, you know, after worship, uh, for fellowship, to be better together, to really engage with each other, give time for our, our teachers to get their classes in time and not feel rushed and really be a part of, of the fellowship. So uh, it shows 10:30. It's going to be 10:50 as when we'll be starting our classes, um, starting on May 2nd. So 9:30 worship and 10:50 classes on Sunday morning. What's that going to look like? So our kids' classes, we worked with our uh, education committee. Uh, our kids' classes are all staffed. We've got teachers ready to go for that. So I believe the same, the same grade. Uh, um, delineations there will be in place and we've got our teachers we will be having only one adult class we're going to meet as an adult class uh, in the auditorium uh, Greg Ball has generously agreed to uh, um, teach that at least for some amount of time we're going to be looking to do some rotations with that through our adult class to have uh, more engagement again better together more engagement uh, really making uh, everybody uh, really feel a part of this congregation so uh, one one adult class starting Sunday morning uh, May 2nd uh, that Wednesday we'll be starting our Wednesday night classes so May 5th we'll start our Wednesday night class uh, that's also a day we're going to return to having our Wednesday night fellowship meals um, the times all that will be published here coming up on times uh, but we'll be having our first fellowship meal that day uh, one of our, our uh, congregational members has generously agreed to pay for that meal so um, there's no excuse it's free it's free to you guys it's free we want you here we want to fellowship with each other we want to be a part of that uh, the only expectation is that you sign up in advance you know we've got a plan for that we've got to buy the right amount of food uh, miss brenda and, and leanne are going to be uh, helping with that and i'm sure they'll recruit others but um, we got to sign up so the sunday prior uh, there'll be a sign up sheet but also uh, i'm sure you can reach out to the office and let them know to give them ample time to, to purchase and, and prepare for that so uh, may 5th wednesday may 5th will be our first wednesday night class and uh, hope to see good turnout at our meal and also our, our um, um, for the services so uh, what's that going to look like from a format standpoint right now on that first Wednesday we're going to be continuing with our uh, meeting in the fellowship hall uh, we'll be having our devotional period uh, as far as classes we're going to have two classes uh, starting on Wednesday May 5th we will have um, a, co a combination uh, adult class that's going to be uh, taught by Actually, we're going to have three classes. I guess our kids' classes will meet for sure. And then the adult class is going to be taught by Phil Sanders uh, downstairs here. And then the ladies' class that was meeting in 206-208 will still be meeting, uh, I assume, in 206-208. Uh, so there will be that ladies' class, um, everybody else in the adult classes, and then, then our kids' classes. So uh, that's exciting. Uh, that's our next shift, getting back to the term normalcy. 
and uh, we're excited about that. Uh, the elders, for those that don't know, we've been meeting very regularly, especially as we've, as Tim and, and Ben and I have come uh, on board. Uh, we've got a lot of things that we've been talking about, a lot of opportunities as we move forward here in 2021. Uh, we're excited. Uh, we're glad to be a part of what's going on right now with Riverwood and as we move forward. So I appreciate everybody being here this morning. Those are online. Uh, we hope to see you back soon with us, uh, but we, uh, we always uh, want everybody to feel safe as well. So we're going to close in prayer and uh, hopefully enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Let's bow. Lord, we're thankful for today, Lord, the opportunity to just be here, to be here to, to sing praises to you, to, to fellowship, to learn about what's going on in each other's lives, to, to, to learn how we can help lift each other up, to pray for each other, to, uh, to just offer a word of encouragement. Uh, we're thankful for the lesson this morning on stewardship. We, 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 we need to be reminded, Lord, that, you, that everything we have is yours, uh, that, that the blessings that we have, whether it's our stuff, whether it's our, our talents, um, whether it, anything that we have is through you, and we need to always give honor and praise uh, to you for that. Lord, we're thankful for the beautiful day we have outside today, the, the great weather we have, the opportunity to uh, hopefully get outside, enjoy your beauty uh, with our families, uh, and just uh, continue to, to live, live out uh, the example that, uh, that, that you, you showed for us. Lord, be with us throughout this day. Help us to find ways to, to be better, uh, better Christians, to be a better um, stronger congregation here at the Riverwood Church to, to be better in our community uh, and, and to find ways to, uh, to really demonstrate you in all that we do. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.